Namaste, everyone. Thanks for coming. It's been a while, Andy. Um, I don't know if um, you're still in Ethiopia. Are you? Um, just got back. Just got back. Nice. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, I would love to hear um, more about it. Um, but oh, yeah, we're a, li a couple of minutes late to start here. So let me get going. But maybe yeah, afterward yeah. or sometime, I would love to hear about it. It sounded like some cool adventures over there. Thanks, brother. And it'd be great to hear about Europe. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, <laughs> thank you. All right. Um, so we are in um, Srimad Bhagavatam, book six, discourse four, um, which is entitled Daksha extols the Lord who appears in person before him. Uh, we just finished the story of um, Ajamila. So, Dave, I'm sorry, what, what are the numbers again? What's the chapter again, verse and chapter? Book six, discourse four. Thank you. So continuing the dialogue between um, the Raja Parikshit and um, uh, Shuka, the Raja submitted, the genesis of the devas and asuras, human beings and nagas, beasts and birds, in the Manvantara presided over by Svayam Bhuvamanu, was described by you in a nutshell. I desire to know from you the details of it, O glorious sage, as well as how and with what power the Supreme Lord evolved the subsequent creation. Sutta continued. Um, Shuka, the son of Badarayana, the great contemplative sage ever united with the Lord, welcomed this noble inquiry of the Raja Rishi Parikshit on hearing it and replied, O jewels among sages. Sri Shuka began again. When the ten prachetas, the sons of King Pratina Barhi, emerged from the lake and saw the earth covered with trees, this is a reference to a story that we had way back, I think it's in book three of the Bhagavatam. They got angry with the trees and breathed out wind and fire from their mouths with the intention of burning them, their wrath having been stimulated by asceticism, by the heat of tapas. Finding the trees being consumed by wind and fire, O uh, Parikshit, Sion of Kuru, Soma, the moon god, um, the mighty ruler of the vegetable kingdom, spoke to the prachetas as though, uh, as though appeasing their anger. It is not becoming of you to bear hostility to the poor trees, since you are declared to be the rulers of created beings and eager to promote their growth. O oh, the immortal and all-pervading Lord Sri Hari, the ruler of prajapatis, has brought into existence the trees and annual plants as the food of the pitris and devas, um, the immobile creatures constitute the food of the mobile ones. In other words, that mobile creatures eat plants. Um, the footless creatures constitute the food of those walking on feet. The handless are the food of those provided with hands, while quadrupeds, as well as the annual plants, are the source of food for human beings. Moreover, how can it be worthy of you? who have been commanded by your father, as well as by the Lord, adored even of the gods, to procreate children, O sinless ones, to burn away trees that sustain all living beings. Therefore, follow the paths of the virtuous, trodden by your father, grandfather, and great-grandfathers, and curb your intensified anger. The parents are the friends of children, the eyelashes of an eye, the husband of a woman, the sovereign of a people, the householder of mendicants, and a wise man is the friend of the ignorant. The almighty Sri Hari indwells the hearts of living beings as their inner controller. Therefore regard the entire creation, animate and inanimate as his abode. In this way, he will be really propitiated by you. He who subdues by means of an inquiry into the self, violent anger gushing forth from the cavity of the heart in his body is able to transcend the gunas and um, be transmuted into um, peace and cease to be anger. Add no more to the number of trees burnt, helpless as they are, and let the surviving ones enjoy your protection. Let this excellent maid, 
and, and by maid, they mean um, woman, not like a serving maid, brought up by the trees be accepted as a wife by you. This is all in reference to, the story was told in detail in book three of the Bhagavatam. He was just kind of flashing back to explain that he's going to elaborate some more on this one, but, um, but he's not getting back into the whole story of how they married Marisha, the daughter of the trees, and so on. Having thus pacified the Prachetas and handed over the beautiful daughter of Pramlocha, King Soma, the moon god, returned to his abode, and the Prachetas wedded her consistently with virtue. Um, from their loins through her was sprung Daksha, the Prachetasa, meaning the son of the Prachetas, by whose progeny and their descendants all the three worlds were filled on all sides. Um, there's a footnote here that I think is somewhat interesting to note. Um, it should be noted here that while this Daksha was born in the very first, or the Swayam Bhuva Manvantara of the present Kalpa, he begot offspring only in the sixth Manvantara, the Chakshusha Manvantara. Um, thus it will appear that he devoted this inconceivably long period of his life in austerities as a preparation for his momentous role of creation. Um, yeah, so yes, that's very true. He, had, he was many millions of years old before he started having children. Now hear from me attentively how Daksha, who was fond of his daughters, procreated beings by his mind and by seed. Daksha Prajapati procreated these beings, dwelling in the air, on land, and in water, devas, asuras, human beings, and so on, by his mind alone in the first instance. Seeing the procreation of his race not multiplying, in other words, he could, he could create children only with his mind, but they themselves did not have children. The said Prajapati proceeded to the hills adjoining the Vindhya mountain and practiced austerities hard to perform, bathing there thrice a day, in the morning and evening and at midday, in the holy lake called Agamarsana, which was supremely efficacious in destroying one's sins, he propitiated Sri Hari through asceticism. He extolled the Lord, who was beyond sense perception, by means of the hymn called Hansa Guhya. I shall repeat to you that hymn, through which Sri Hari was pleased with Daksha. The Prajapati prayed, I offer salutations to the self-effulgent supreme of infallible consciousness, the controller of both the jiva and prakriti, whose true nature is not perceived by those that take the objects of senses to be real and who is beyond the means of cognition. I make obeisance to that Supreme Lord whose beneficent nature and friendly attitude, the jiva dwelling in this body, his constant companion, does not know. Even though the Lord lives with the jiva as the latter's friend, he being the seer of this visible universe, just as an object of perception cannot perceive the illuminating quality of the sense that perceives it. The body, the vital airs, the senses, the internal senses, which are the mind, the understanding, the intellect, and the ego, roughly translated to English, and the gross and subtle elements know neither themselves nor any other, nor that which is beyond. In other words, that it's not like the sense of sight itself knows something. It's part of the consciousness of a greater being, and so on. The jiva knows all these, as well as the gunas, but though knowing these, it does not know the all-knowing Lord who is infinite. I extol him. Hail to that pure substance, revealed in a pure mind, that is revealed through its absolute existence, when the mind, which manifests this world of names and forms, ceases to function due to the extinction of all cognition and recollection, referring to in um, pure samadhi. The wise find him out by their purified intellect, as installed within their heart, though veiled by his nine potencies, consisting of the three gunas, as well as by the 16 other principles. So the nine potencies being Prakriti, Purusha, Mahatattva, Ahankara, and the five Tanmatras, and the 16 other principles being the mind, the five senses of perception, the five organs of action, and the five gross elements. As those well-versed in rituals produce the sacrificial fire hidden in wood by reciting the 15 sacred texts known as the Samidheni mantras. 
Indeed, he is realized in the form of the joy of liberation, when Maya, the source of all distinctions, has been negated. It is he who bears all names and assumes all forms, possessed as he is of potencies too numerous to be described and which constitute his very essence. May he shower his grace on me. Whatever is described in words, determined with the intellect, or perceived with the senses, or even pondered with the mind, cannot be his essential nature, for all that is a manifestation of the three gunas, while he, as a matter of fact, is indicated by the evolution and dissolution of the universe. Wherever, from whatever motive, by whatever means, or with, what, or with whatever instrument, for whomsoever or whatever purpose, whatever, however, and whosoever's uh, work, whoever does or is prompted to do, all that is Brahman, which is their cause, inasmuch as it is known to have existed before them, and which is the ultimate cause of all causes, both earlier and later, and is without a second, whether of the same category or of a different kind. Hail to that all-pervading self, possessed of endless virtues, whose manifold potencies indeed become the ground of disputation and concurrence between theorists putting forward their claims and delude their mind now and again. In yoga and sankhya, which though professing faith in the one reality ascribe two distinct and mutually contradictory attributes to it, the one claiming that it has hands and feet, etc., and the other denying them, and yet having a common basis, that which is found to be common and beyond dispute, and which is acceptable to both, is Brahman. May that almighty and infinite supreme be gracious to me, who, though devoid of name and form, manifested from time to time forms through descent, through avadharana, and names through exploits, in order to shower his grace on those who resort to the soles of his feet. May that Lord grant my wish, who, though dwelling in the body of men, appears diversified according to their tendencies and in consonance with the systems of worship of recent origin, even as the air breathes fragrance of various kinds on coming into contact with the odor of different flowers, etc., or appears dusky white when the color of dust is transferred to it. Sri Sukha continued. Thus extolled, the celebrated Lord, who was fond of his devotees, appeared in person, O Parikshit, foremost of the Kurus, before Daksha, on the strand of that sacred lake called Aghamarshana. He had um, his feet flung across the shoulders of Garuda, the king of the birds, and was possessed of eight mighty and exceptionally long arms in which he carried a discus, a conch, a sword, a shield, an arrow, a bow, a noose, and a mace. Clad in yellow and dark as a cloud, he had a cheerful countenance and eyes sparkling with joy. His body was adorned with a garland of sylvan flowers extending down to his feet and bore the brilliant mark of Srivatsa and the Kaustubha gem. He wore a large crown and precious bangles about his ankles and a shining pair of crocodile-shaped earrings and was adorned with a girdle, rings, bracelets, anklets, and armlets. Possessed of a form that captivated all the three worlds, the Lord of the whole universe was surrounded by his attendants, Narada, Nanda, and so on, as well as by the chief among the gods, the guardians of the spheres, and extolled by Siddhas, Gandharvas, and Charanas, who were singing songs behind him. Filled with awe and yet extremely rejoiced at heart to behold that most wonderful beauty, Daksha Prajapati fell prostrate on the ground and could not speak anything because of his senses being flooded with intense delight as rivers with mountain torrents. To that Prajapati, who was a devotee and desired to be blessed with progeny, and who was crouching as aforesaid, Lord Vishnu, the knower of the mind of all living beings, spoke as follows. The Lord said, O highly blessed Daksha, the son of the Prachetas, you have fully achieved your end through asceticism in that you have developed supreme devotion to me thanks to your reverence solely directed towards me. I am pleased with you, O, Pr o Prajapati, inasmuch as your asceticism is conducive to the growth of this creation. It is my wish that all created beings should thrive. Brahma, Lord, the creator, Lord Shiva, the source of the universe, yourselves, the Prajapatis, the Manus, and the chief of the gods, the guardians of the spheres, Indra and others, 
being the um, the us that the Palikas. Indeed, these are my glorious manifestation, making for the prosperity of created beings. Asceticism, in the form of contemplation accompanied by the practice of the yamas and niyamas, is my heart. Worship, in the form of the muttering of mantras with all the auxiliary practices like nyasa, etc., is my body because it gives a concrete shape to meditation and serves as a protective covering for meditation, even as the body protects the heart. Um, the activity is my exterior. Sacrifices well performed are the members of my body. The merit resulting from such sacrifices is my mind, and the gods are my vital heirs. Before creation, I alone existed, and that too in a state of absolute inactivity. There was nothing else in the form of the perceiving subject or the perceived object. I was mere consciousness and unmanifest. It seemed as if a state of deep sleep prevailed on all sides. When in my infinite being, possessed of endless attributes, sprang up through Maya this cosmos made up of the three gunas, there arose in that very cosmos Brahma, the self-born, the cause of all, not born of a mother's womb. When that great God girded up his loins for the work of creation, he, as a matter of fact, thought himself unequal to it, as it were, though supplemented with my energy. That all-powerful divinity accordingly practiced severe austerities as enjoined by me, for recourse to which he evolved at the very outset nine prajapatis, nine lords of creation, including yourself. This daughter of Panchajana, a prajapati like you, Asikni by name, should be accepted by you, O dear Daksha, as wife. Following the righteous course of sexual intercourse between a married couple, you shall again beget progeny in large numbers through her, who will follow the prescribed course of sexual union between a wedded couple. All created beings after you will be born by copulating with my Maya and bear offerings to me. Sri Shuka went on. Having spoken thus, Lord Srihari, the promoter of the universe, disappeared on that very spot, like an object seen in a dream, as Daksha looked on. Thus ends the fourth discourse in Book 6 of the great and the glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita. Discourse 5, Narada subjected to an execration by Daksha. Sri Shuka resumed. Indeed, energized by Lord Vishnu's Maya, the aforesaid Daksha Prajapati begot through Panchajani 10,000 sons known as the Hariyashvas. Alike in conduct and disposition, all those sons of Daksha, O king, proceeded in a westerly direction when commanded by their father to beget offspring. There they reached a most extensive and holy lake called Narayanasara, situated in the area where the river Sindhu falls into the sea. So that would be on the, um, the coast of what is today Pakistan. And resorted to by sages and Siddhas. By merely bathing therein, they not only had their mind thoroughly cleansed of all impurities, but also developed an inclination to follow the path of ascetics of the highest order. Yet they practiced severe austerities alone, bound as they were by the command of their father. In other words, that they're um, practicing tapas for the purpose of creating children, um, rather than turning their goal toward moksha in order to fulfill the, the dharma with which they have been tasked. Narada, the Devarishi, it is said, saw them intent on increasing the population of the world and forthwith said, O Hariyashvas, without having seen the end of the earth, how, how will you be able to actually beget progeny? The protectors, alas, you are ignorant. Similarly, without fully knowing the country inhabited by a single person, the whole with no visible outlet, the woman assuming different forms, and even so the man who is the husband of a harlot, the river running both ways, the wonderful house built of 25 materials, the swan at one place, which has a strange story to tell, and something exceedingly sharp and strong, independent and revolving. And without having understood the command of your omniscient father suitable for you, how will you proceed with creation? Sri Shuka continued, hearing these enigmatic words of Narada, the Devarishi, the Hariyashvas presently pondered over them with their own intellect, which was endowed with innate quickness of perception. They said, the earth is the field 
and known as the jiva, which has existed from remote antiquity and serves as a fetter for the soul. Without seeing its extinction, what is to be gained through useless actions? The Lord is the sole ruler, the witness of all the three states of the mind, and hence known as the fourth or transcendent principle, beyond the three states of waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, who is supported by his own self and is higher than all. Without seeing him who is eternally free from birth, what purpose can be achieved by man through useless activities? What is to be achieved in this world through useless acts by him who has not realized the self-effulgent Brahman, on attaining which a man does not return, any more than one who has reached the heaven-like subterranean regions returns to the earth in the same life? The intellect of a jiva, which is imbued with the three gunas and which takes the shape of the various objects of senses, is like a wanton woman appearing in various guises and possessed of many alluring qualities. What can be gained in this world through useless activities by him who has not risen above such a diversified intellect? What is to be gained here through useless acts by the man who does not recognize himself as having fallen from his greatness through identification with such an intellect and follows, like the husband of an unchaste woman, its courses? What can be achieved through useless actions by the man who is so forgetful that he fails to recognize the frightfulness of Maya that brings about, crea brings about creation and destruction and acquires impetuosity near the, near the guts and banks of its stream. The Purusha is the wonderful mirror of the 25 categories. Without knowing him as presiding over the collection of causes and effects, what is to be gained here through useless actions? Ignoring the body of teachings establishing the existence of God, which not only distinguishes spirit from matter, but further enables one to perceive the true nature of bondage and liberation, what can be achieved here through useless actions? What will be gained here through useless actions? By him who has no knowledge of the wheel of time, which is revolving, sharp-edged and independent, and destroys the whole creation. How can he who does not know the precepts of his father, the Shastra, um, proceed to act in conformity with such precepts? Thus resolved, O king, the Haryashvas, who were of one mind, went round the sage and took to the path which does not bring one back to the mortal plane. Having fixed his undivided mind on the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu, the controller of the senses, as revealed in the notes of the gamut, which stand as a symbol of the all-pervading Brahman, the sage Narada went about the spheres. Having... Um, swayed the Haryashvas off the path of creation and toward the path of moksha. Having heard of the straying of his virtuous sons at the instigation of Narada, Daksha fell a-sorrowing and felt distressed. It is a source of grief to have good children. Fully consoled by Brahma, essentially meaning that your children may not do what you wish they would, and thus it is, and thus it is a source of grief to have them. Fully consoled by Brahma, who was not born of a mother's womb, Daksha begot through Panchajani a thousand sons more, He's trying a second time, known as the Shabalashpas. Expressly enjoined by their father to beget children, they made a firm resolve to practice austerities and repaired to Narayanasara, where the elder brothers had achieved their object in the shape of God-realization through divine love. Their mind thoroughly cleansed of impurities to a mere bath in that lake. They practiced great austerity there, muttering the most sacred syllable, Om. Living for some months on water alone, and subsisting for several months after that on nothing but air, they worshipped Bhagavan Vishnu, the lord of all the sacred texts, repeating the following sacred formula. We make obeisance to Lord Narayana, the goal of all the jivas, denoted by the mystical syllable, Om, the highest person, the supreme spirit, appearing in a form made up of sattva unmixed with rajas and tamas, the purest of the pure. The sage Narada, O Parikshit, king of kings, approached those princes also who were thus intent on, re on renewing the creation and addressed to them enigmatic words, similar to those addressed before. Duly hear from me as I tell you, O sons of Daksha, the following precept. Discover the path trodden by your brothers for whom you cherish such affection. A brother who knows his duty and follows the exalted path of his brothers, and who is followed by his virtue, rejoices along with the Maruts. 
Maruts um, are um, brother, a, a host of very brotherly devas. That's the reference there. Saying this much, the sage Narada, whose sight never fails to bring its reward, withdrew. And they too follow the path of their brothers alone, O noble one. Having taken to the noble and agreeable path leading to the supreme, a path which can be reached only by those whose thought is turned inward, they, like the bygone knights, do not return even to this day. Seeing many an evil portent at this time, the, an evil portent meaning a, a signs that his wishes are not being fulfilled, signs that his sons are not begetting children, in other words, the Prajapati Daksha heard of the ruination of his sons at the hands of the sage Narada as before. Overpowered with grief for his sons, he got angry with Narada, and on meeting with the sage addressed him, his lips quivering through rage. Daksha said, Ah, appearing in the garb of a holy man, O wicked one, you have done a disservice to our youngsters who were virtuous, and that you showed them the path of a mendicant. You have ruined their interests, O sinful one. In both the worlds, while they had not yet been exonerated from their threefold obligations, nor had they pondered over the futility of activities. Um, in other words, that they, um, the threefold obligations um, is a reference to every member of the twice born classes, in other words, of um, Brahmans, Kshatriyas, and Vaishyas, um, are declared by the Vedas to have a debt to the Rishis, a debt to the Pitris, and a debt to the Devas. Um, the debt to the Rishis requires them to study the Vedas um, under the vow of Brahmacharya. The debt to the Pitris, to their ancestors, requires them to marry and have children. Um, and the debt to the Devas requires them to perform yajna. So that's what Daksha is referencing there, is that teaching from the Vedas. Um, and the teaching that um, that Moksha should be pursued by the path of renunciation only after going through worldly activities and realizing their futility firsthand. He's objecting to skipping straight to it. Mercilessly unsettling in this way the mind of youngsters, you have tarnished the fair name of the Lord, and you shamelessly move in the midst of his attendants. Barring you who have trampled love and actually shown enmity to us who are not enemies, the votaries of the Lord are undoubtedly ever anxious to shower their grace on living beings. Vairagya, which is um, freedom from attachment to the world, cannot be engendered in the mind of the people in this way by you, who have assumed the guise of an ascetic without true wisdom. Even as you regard quietism as a means of cutting us under the bonds of attachment, a man cannot realize the bitterness of the pleasures of sense without tasting them. He whose mind has been unsettled by others would not feel disgusted with the world so fully as he might of his own accord. We put up with the wrong what you did to us, householders, vowed to the performance of rituals and intent on achieving heavenly bliss, even though the wrong was such as could not be easily forgotten. Inasmuch as you have done an offense against us for a second time, O fool responsible for breaking the continuity of our race, therefore you will have no halt as you wander through the spheres." meaning um, that we will not give you lodging anywhere. That, um, he's no longer welcome as a guest. Sri Shuka went on. The sage Narada, who was esteemed even by the virtuous, accepted the curse with the words, very well. The curse that he would wander ceaselessly and have no home. That he who is himself powerful should put up with another's offense. This alone entitles a man to the title of a pious soul. In other words, that he simply accepted Daksha's curse when he indeed could have countered it. Thus ends the fifth discourse entitled Narada Subjected to an Execration in book six of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanhita. Discourse six, the posterity of Daksha through his 60 daughters. Srisukha resumed. Pacified and prevailed upon by Brahma, the self-born, Daksha, the son of the Pracheta, then begot through Asikni, his wife. So, um, his wife has multiple names, so you'll sometimes hear of her referred to by one name, sometimes by another. Sixty daughters who were affectionate towards their father. He gave away ten of them to Dharma, that's um, Yamadeva, thirteen to the sage Kashyapa, son of Marichi, 
thrice nine, so 27 of them, to the moon god, Soma or Chandra, two each to the sages Bhuta, Angira, and Krishashva, and the rest to Kashyapa. Um, here it calls him Tarakshya, but Tarakshya is just is another name of Kashyapa. Hear you from me their names, as well as the names of their offspring, by whose children and their descendants the three worlds were filled on all sides. Bhanu, Lamba, Kakub, Jami, Vishva, Sadhya, Marutvati, Vasu, Muhurta, and Sankalpa were Dharma's wives, the ten who married Dharma Deva or Yama Deva. Here are the names of their sons. Of Bhanu, in the first instance, was born Devarashabha, and from Devarashabha sprang up Indra Sena. Vidyota was the son of Lamba, and from Vidyota appeared the spirits presiding over the clouds. The son of Kakub was, uh, was Sankata, and Sankata's son was Kikata, from whom appeared the spirits presiding over the fortresses on earth. Svarga was the son of Jami, and from Svarga appeared Nandi. The sons of Vishva were the Vishvedevas, a group of 10 gods. The learned speak of them as issueless. In other words, the Vishvedevas had no children. Again, the group of gods called the Sadhyas was born of Sadhya, and Artasiddhi was their son. Marutvan and Jayanta were born of Marutpati. Jayanta was a part manifestation of Lord Vasudeva, an Ancha avatar. He is also known by the name of Upendra. Again, a race of gods called, called the Mauhurtikas, uh, which are the, the devas of the hours. Um, there's 30 of them was born of Muhurta. They actually dispensed to living beings the fruit appropriate to the division of time presided over by each. Of Sankalpa, again, was born Sankalpa, the deity presiding over thoughts. Kama has been declared to be the progeny of Sankalpa. The eight Vasus, another group of gods, are the sons of Vasu. Hear their names from me. Drona, Prana, Dr Dhruva, Arka, Agni, Dosha, Vasu and Vibhavasu. Of Abhimati, the wife of Drona, were born Harsha, Shoka, Bhaya, and others, um, the deities of emotions like joy, grief, fear, and so on. Urjasvati was the wife of Prana, and Saha, Ayu, and Purojava, his sons. Dhruva's wife, Dharani, bore the deities presiding over the various cities and towns. Vasana, the deity presiding over latent desires, was the wife of Arka, and Tarsha, the deity presiding over excessive longing, and others are known to be his sons. Dhara is the Vasu named Agni, another name of the Vasu named Agni, and Dravenaka and others are his sons. Skanda was the son of Krataka, um, that is Skanda, the god Kartikeya, um, the son of the, the six Krataka deities. Uh, well, Vishaka and others sprang up from Skanda. The son of Dosha through Sharvari was Shishumara, a scintillation of Sri Hari or a gleaming of Sri Hari as the, um, the dolphin made of the stars, who was described earlier in Book 5. Vishvakarma, the architect of the gods, the husband of Akriti, was the son of Vasu through Angirasi a daughter of the sage Angira. From Vishvakarma appeared Chakshushamanu. Um, the group of gods called the Vishvedevas and the Sadhyas are the sons of Chakshushamanu. Usha, the wife of Vibhavasu, gave birth to Vyushta, Rochish, and Atapa. From Atapa sprang up Panchayama, the deity presiding over the daytime, because of whom living beings remain awake and engaged in activities. Again, Sarupa, the wife of Bhuta, brought forth the Rudras in crores. Of these, of the crores of Rudras, Raivata, Aja, Bhava, Bhima, Vama, Ugra, Prashakapi, Ajaikapada, Ahirbudhya, Bahurupa, and Mahan were the foremost. And the terrible attendants of Rudra, the Pretas and Vinayakas, were distinct from the Rudras. Again, the wife of Angira, 
a Prajapati, or Lord of Created Beings, Svadha was her name, accepted the Pitris for her sons, the souls of the currently um, unincarnate ancestors. Um, while his other wife, Sati, adopted Atarvaveda um, as her son. This is a different Sati, not the Sati who married Shiva. Krishashva begot Dhumrakesha through his wife Archi, and Vedashira, Devala, Vayuna, and Manu through his second wife, Dhishana. Vinata, Kadru, Patangi, and Yamini um, were the other four wives of the sage Kashyapa or Tarksya. So his, his main name is Kashyapa. He's called Tarksya because um, his father, Marichi, had the title of Triksha. And so his son was also called Tarksya, the son of Triksha. Patangi gave birth to birds, while Yamini brought forth moths. The, she was the moth goddess. Vinata, also called Suparna, bore Garuda, who carries Bhagavan Vishnu himself, as well as Aruna, the charioteer of the sun god, while Kadru brought forth the numerous varieties of Nagas. Again, the deities presiding over the 27 nakshatras, Krataka and so on, are the wives of Soma, Oparikshit, scion of Bharata. Plagued with the devilish disease of consumption due to the curse of Daksha, However, the moon god got no issue by any of them. Propitiating Daksha again, Soma secured the digits intercepted during the waning fortnight. Now here are the auspicious names of Kashyapa's wives, the other ones than the four we heard of, Vinata and Yamini and Kadru and um, so on. Um, the mothers of living beings by whom this universe was brought forth. Aditi, Diti, Danu, Kashta, Arishta, Surasa, <laughs> Ila, Muni, Krodhavasha, Tamra, Surabhi, Sarama, and Timi. Um, of Timi were born the species of aquatic creatures, um, especially whales are said to be her children. Uh, while wild animals are the offspring of Sarama. Asarama is um, the dog goddess. Um, there's whole chapters about her in the Rig Veda and other Vedas. Of Surabhi were born the buffaloes, the bovine race, and whatever other beasts with cloven hoofs there are, O king. Of Tamra were born the hawk, the vulture, and other birds, while the hosts of celestial nymphs of Apsaras were born of Muni. Reptiles, such as the snake, O king, are the progeny of Krodhavasha. From Ila appeared the whole vegetable kingdom, while the Rakshasas are the offspring of Surasa. The Gandharvas are the progeny of Arishta, and beasts with uncloven hooves, such as the horse and the donkey, of Kashta. The sons of Danu number 61. Here are the chiefs of them. They are, the, so these are the chief um, Danava Asuras. They are Dvimurdha, Shambara, Arishta, Hayagriva. That's um, Hayagriva, not to be confused with the Vishnu's avatar Hayagriva. Vibhavasu, Ayomuka, um, Shankushira, Svarbhanu. Svarbhanu, when cut in half, later became Rahu and Ketu. Kapila, Aruna, Puloma, Vrashaparva, and Eka Chakra. Anutapana, Dhumrakesha, Virupaksha, Viprachiti, and Durjaya. Namochi, it is said, married Supra, uh, Suprabha, the daughter of Svarbhanu, while the mighty Yayati, son of Nahusha, a human king, wedded Sarmishta, the daughter of Rishaparva. Now hear the names of the four daughters of Vaishvanara, another son of Danu, um, who were all charming to look at. Upadanavi, Hayashira, Uloma and Kalaka. Of these, Hiranyaksha espoused Upadanavi and Kratu Hayashira Oparikshit, and urged by Brahma the creator, the glorious Kashyapa Prajapati married the other two daughters of Vaishvanara, Puloma and Kalaka. 
Of these were born 60,000 Danavas, the great grandsons of Danu, known as the Paulomas, those who were born to Puloma, and the Kalakeyas were born to Kalaka, who distinguished themselves in battle. When in heaven, meaning in Svargaloka, on a friendly visit, your father's father, O Parikshit, referring to the Pandava Arjuna, slew them single-handed in order to please Indra, the lord of Svarga, inasmuch as they wrecked his sacrificial performances. That's a, um, a huge war called the um, Nevata Kavacha War, referred to in the Mahabharata. Viprachiti begot through his wife Singhika, a lion goddess, 101 sons, the eldest of whom was Rahu, also known as Farbhanu, who attained to the position of a graha, the other hundred being the ketus, in this case, the ketus meaning the asuras who preside over comets, separate from the graha ketu. Now, from this point onward, here in order of sequence of the race that proceeded from Aditi, in which the almighty Lord Narayana himself appeared by manifesting a part of his, of his own being. Vivasvan, Aryama, Pusha, Dvashta, Savita, Bhaga, Dhata, Vidhata, Varuna, Mitra, Chakra, and Vamana. These are the 12 sons of Aditi who preside over the sun one after another month by month throughout the solar year. Chakra is who we call Indra. So Indra is actually a title. Chakra is actually also a title. Um, his, the current Indra's actual name is Purandara, but uh, we're talking about a previous Manvantara when Indra was someone else. The highly blessed Sangya, a wife of Vivasvan, Vivasvan is more often known as Surya, the sun god, the, the primary sun god, brought forth Sradhadeva, who rose to be the Manu during the present Manvantara, and a son and daughter born as twins, the god Yama and Yami. Um, Yami is better known as Yamuna, the goddess of the river Yamuna. Then appearing as a mare on earth, the same lady, um, Sangya Devi, gave birth to the twin-born Ashvini Kumaras. Vivasvan's other wife, Chaya, the shadow goddess, got through her husband a couple of sons, Shaneshara, the um, Shani Deva, the um, Deva of the planet Saturn, and Savarni who is the next Manu. He's already been born, but he hasn't been Manu yet. He's in line to be the next Manu. As well as a daughter, Tapati, who indeed chose King Sanvarana for her husband. Aryama's wife was Matrika, and their sons were called the Charshanis because they were full of wisdom. It was after them, as endowed with a special aptitude for self-examination, that the human species was evolved by Brahma, the creator more capable of self-examination than um, other animals. Pusha, the third son of Aditi, who had had his teeth broken of yore because he had shown his teeth and laughed at Rudra, seeing him angry at Daksha. That was mentioned back in book four of the Bhagavatam and consequently lived on flour because his teeth are broken, remained without issue. A girl, Rachana by name, who was a younger sister of the Daityas, became the wife of Tvashta, the god Tvashta. Of the aforesaid couple were born two sons, Sannivesha and the powerful Vishvarupa. The hosts of devas chose Vishvarupa for their guru, even though he was a nephew of their enemies, the Daityas, inasmuch as they had been deserted by their own guru, the sage Brahaspati son of Angira, who was insulted by them. Thus ends the sixth discourse in book six of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanhita. Discourse seven, deserted by the sage Brahaspati, the devas choose Vishvarupa for their guru. So the king Parikshit interrupted um, Shuka at that point and said, for what reason were the devas forsaken by their own guru, the sage Brahaspati? Kindly tell me, O glorious sage, the transgression made by the disciples with respect to their guru, which brought matters to such a pass. Sri Shuka replied, Indra, who had transgressed the path frequented by the virtuous through arrogance caused by the lordship of the worlds, O king, was seated on the throne in his court, surrounded by the Maruts, the 49 wind gods, 
uh, wind gods as in like impetuous stormy winds, not the main wind god who is Vayudeva. The eight Vasus, the 11 Rudras, the 11 other Adityas besides himself, the Ribhus, the Vishvedevas, and the Sadhyas, as well as by the Ashvini Kumaras. The great Maghava, another name of Indra, was being waited upon and extolled by all of them. Oparikshit, descendant of Bharata, by the Siddhas, Charanas, Gandharvas, sages, who were great expositors of the Vedas, as well as by Vidyadharas and Apsaras, Kinnaras, birds and Nagas, and his praises were being sweetly sung. Provided with a white umbrella, charming as the orb of the moon, and other insignia of supreme royalty, such as chauris and fans, he shone most splendid with Shachi, the daughter of Puloma, who shared the throne with him. Um, you might notice daughter of Puloma, um, Indra's queen, is indeed an Asura, who he married, Shachi. When, as would appear from the following account, he did not welcome by rising, offering a seat and other honors, the chief guru of all the devas, including himself, Brahaspati, the foremost of sages, adored by the devas as well as the asuras, as he came in. Nay, Indra did not even stir from his seat, even on seeing the sage present in his court. The enlightened sage, a son of Angira, went out of the court at once and quietly returned to his own residence, though powerful enough that, that he could have corrected his disciple, aware of the aberration brought about by pride of affluence and power. Realizing that very moment the disrespect shown by him towards his guru, Indra spontaneously himself reproached his own self in the court. He said, oh, my conduct has been deplorably unrighteous in that the guru was slighted in court by me, a creature of poor wits indeed and maddened by power and opulence. What prudent person will covet the fortune even of the Lord of Paradise by which I, the ruler of the devas, have been dragged into egotism? They do not know the highest morality who declare that one occupying the throne of a suzerain lord should not rise to receive anybody. They that believe the words of the aforesaid misleading guides who undoubtedly fall down into the dark regions of hell surely sink like those embarking on a ship of rock. Guilelessly touching his feet with my head, I shall presently propitiate the Brahmana, the preceptor of the devas, who is endowed with fathomless intelligence. While Indra was pondering thus on his error and assuring everyone that he would immediately correct it, the all-wise Brahaspati disappeared from his house by dint of his extraordinary yogic power, because he wants to test and admonish Indra a little bit further and not make it so easy to apologize. Getting no clue to the whereabouts of his guru, though looking for him all around, the glorious Indra reflected by force of reason but felt no peace of mind, though united with the devas. As soon as they heard of this, the haughty asuras all took up arms and made preparations for war against the devas, following the advice of the sage Shukracharya, their guru. Who, um, so Shukra and Brahaspati, the gurus of the asuras and of the devas, are old rivals from their childhood and constantly making war on each other. And so Shukra sees an opportunity if Brahaspati isn't currently advising the devas. With their limbs, thighs, and arms torn asunder by the sharp pointed arrows discharged by the asuras, the devas led by Indra approached Brahma the creator for protection, their heads bent low. Seeing them afflicted on all sides in this way, the glorious and birthless god Brahma the self-born was moved with supreme compassion and spoke comfortingly. Brahma said, Alas, your conduct has really been most unwelcome, O jewels among devas, in that proud of power and, and pelf, you did not welcome a Brahmana who had not only disciplined his self, but who had realized his identity with Brahman, the absolute. It was the fruit of that misbehavior that you suffered defeat at the hands of others who are your enemies and had grown very weak in spite of your being rich and powerful, O devas. O Indra, look at your enemies, who had grown extremely weak because of the disrespect shown by them to their guru, but who have now gained in strength again by propitiating the sage Kavya, Kavya is another name of Shukra, through devotion. Devoted as they are to Shukra, a scion of the celebrated sage Bhrugu, they may take possession of even my abode, Brahmaloka, Treasuring the precepts of the Bhrugus, Shukracharya and others, as their wealth, and their secrets being impenetrable, 
They hold Svarga as of no account, easy to acquire. No evil can befall the kings who look upon the Brahmanas, Lord Vishnu, the protector of cows, and the cows themselves as their masters. Therefore, immediately resort to Vishvarupa, son of the Deva Tvashta, a Brahmana given to austerities and self-controlled. Treated with respect, he will accomplish your ends, provided, of course, you tolerate what he does. Uh, that, so that's an interesting reference. You tolerate what he does. What he does is that he likes the Asuras. Um, his, his own mother was an Asura. And he, rather than being for the Devas and against the Asuras, loves them both and worships them both. And so Brahma is warning the Devas that if you, if you follow him, you will have to tolerate the fact that he loves and worships the Asuras as well. Sri Shuka continued. Thus spoken to by Brahma, the creator, and relieved of anxiety, O Raja, the Devas approached Vishvarupa, son of Tvashta, the Rishi, and embracing him, he's both a Deva and a Rishi, and embracing him, spoke. The Devas said, we have called at your hermitage as unexpected visitors. May all be well with you. Be pleased, dear son, to fulfill the timely wishes of your uncles. Indeed, service of parents is the highest duty of virtuous sons, even of those that have been blessed with sons. O holy Brahmana, much more of celibates. A guru is Veda incarnate. A father or uncle is an image of Brahma, the Lord of creation. A brother is an effigy of Indra. A mother is a direct incarnation of the goddess Earth. A sister is an embodiment of tenderness. An unexpected visitor is the very incarnation of dharma, because it is an opportunity to perform dharma through hospitality. A guest is an incarnation of the sacred fire, and all living beings are embodiments of the self. Therefore, getting rid by virtue of your asceticism, of the affliction of your parents in the shape of their discomfiture at the hands of their enemies, O oh dear child, you ought to do our bidding. We choose you, a Brahmana established in Brahman and worthy of adoration, as our guru, so that we may easily and fully conquer our enemies through your glory. Indeed, as a means of accomplishing one's ends, the wise do not condemn the act of bowing at the feet of the younger. Setting aside the Vedas, O Brahmana, age is no criterion of seniority. The sage went on. Thus importuned by the hosts of devas to accept the office of their priest, the said Vishvarupa, the great ascetic, felt delighted and replied to them in soft words. Vishvarupa said, Priesthood has been condemned by the virtuous as involving the loss of the spiritual glory investing a Brahmana. Yet how shall a person like me, O masters, turn down the solicitation of guardians of the spheres by whom he deserves to be commanded? For obedience alone is declared as conducive to his good. Shila and Unchana, so Shila is, uh, Shila and Unchana are the wealth of the, of the destitute. Um, this is a saying, Shila means um, gleaning grains that are left in the field after the reaping of the harvest, like the last scraps that farmers left behind. And Unchana is picking up grains lying scattered in a marketplace after the market is closed. Um, these are the wealth of the destitute, meaning Brahmanas who live off um, what they live off donations and what they pick up that no one else needs. Acts appropriate to noble souls being accomplished in this household life by me with the aforesaid means, how shall I take, O suzerain lords, to the reproachable vocation of a priest with which a fool alone remains pleased? Because it involves being well established, having a reliable income, and so on, and thus being tied more to the world than a true renunciate. Yet I dare not decline what is earnestly asked for by you, which is of no account. I shall accomplish all that you have solicited, even at the sacrifice of my life and my interests. Sri Shuka resumed. Having thus promised them, Vishvarupa, a great ascetic, discharged as requested the role of a priest with supreme diligence. Vishvarupa snatched by means of a prayer addressed to Lord Vishnu, the fortune of the Asuras, though protected by means of the prayer taught by Ushana, and, restore, uh, and restored it to the great Indra. So this is interesting. He, the person who, he, who taught him the prayer, the Narayana Kavacha, was Shukracharya, the Asura's guru. And, and he used it to restore Svarga to Indra. The said Vishvarupa, noble-minded as he was, 
taught to the great Indra the above-mentioned prayer, protected by which that mighty Deva with a thousand eyes was able to conquer the Asura hosts. Thus ends the seventh discourse in Book 6 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita. Um, we could do one more, which is just the translation of the Nara and the Kavacha. Um, yeah, the Nara and the Kavacha is a, is a very famous and really great prayer. Uh, of course, when used as a prayer, it's used as a mantra in Sanskrit. But the translation of it is also beautiful, the protection of Narayana. I love Narayana Kavacha. I just love it. It's yeah. like a great um, health remedy given there. Yeah. yeah. So you want to read it today or shall we do it next week? What do you think? Um, well, it's, a, it's, it's close to 10. Okay. We could stop and start with it next time. Um, great. Very good. We can yeah. do it today, but whatever yeah. you feel. Is okay. Good. Yeah. Um, well, if it's all right with you guys, yeah, I'll do it today and then stop there. I think oh. I, I feel like it would be nice to end on. Okay. Okay. It's beautiful. This is yeah. uh, beautiful. It's really beautiful. Yeah. And we can ask questions today and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Afterward. All right. Discourse eight, the text of the Narayana Kavacha. The King Parikshit submitted. O divine sage, teach me that prayer, invoking the succor of Lord Narayana, protected by which Indra, the thousand-eyed, thoroughly and entirely subdued as though in sport the enemy's troops along with their mounts, and enjoyed the fortune of all the three worlds. And tell me how, protected by that armor, he was able to conquer the enemies who came to take his life on the field of battle. Sri Shuka replied, Appointed as a priest, Vishvarupa Sanatvashta taught the Kavacha, named after Lord Narayana, to the great Indra, who had inquired about it. Listen to it with undivided attention on this occasion. Uh, just in case anyone here isn't aware, kavacha in Sanskrit literally means armor. So the Narayana kavacha means the armor of Narayana. Vishvarupa began, in the face of danger, a devotee who has finished his bath and other purificatory rites, such as the morning sandhya, should wash his hands and feet Thrice sip a little water in um, Atamaniya with the Lord's names Keshava, Narayana, and Madhava on his lips. And thus purified, squat on a proper seat with his face towards the north, and wearing a ring of the sacred Kusha grass on the ring finger of each hand. After silently performing the Nyasa, which is the consecration of the various parts of the body, and hands with the two mantras, he should arm himself with a protective covering sacred to Lord Narayana. He should locate the syllables of the mantra Om Namo Narayanaya in order of sequence in his feet. So syllable by syllable in his feet, in the knee joints, the thighs, the belly, the region of the heart, the chest, the mouth, and the crown of the head. One syllable each from the mantra Om Namo Narayanaya from feet to head. or even in the reverse order, known as the Sanghara Nyasa, as opposed to the Utpati Nyasa, um, where placing the syllables ya and so on, followed by the Anushvara or the nasal sound in his head, mouth, etc. So, so saying the mantra backwards and going from head down to feet. Thereafter, he should perform the Karanyasa, which is the consecration of the hands, with the 12 syllabled mantra, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, locating the syllables beginning with om and ending with the last ya um, in the eight fingers that aren't thumbs and in the upper and lower thumb joints so that the the top of the thumb and like down here in the root of the thumb thirdly he should place the syllable om of the following mantra om vishnave namaha in his heart then vi in the crown of his head in the middle of his eyebrows, the third syllable na in the shikan, the, the back of the hair. He should unite the syllable ve with his eyes and the syllable na with all the joints of his body. Then putting the last syllable ma followed by a visarga, a distinct hard aspiration, so maha, and the interjection 
pat to uh to the use of driving away evil spirits so uh pat is is a um, astra mantra a weapon mantra used for driving away evil spirits he should assign this to all the 10 directions um so north south east west the quarters and up and down in order to block the 10 directions against the inroads of evil spirits and demons, etc. Repeating the formula mah astraya part and snapping the thumb and the middle finger together successfully in each direct in each direction to lock them again in the bandha against evil spirits. In this way, the wise devotee becomes a very embodiment of the mantra. Then he should visualize himself as one with the supreme self possessed of the six divine attributes, power, virtue, fame, affluence, wisdom, and freedom from the pleasures of sense, each in the fullest measure. The object of his meditation manifested in the form of learning, glory, and asceticism, and repeat the following prayer. May Sri Hari, denoted by Om, afford me protection on all sides as well as from all dangers. Sri Hari, who has his lotus feet placed on the back of Garuda, the king of the birds who wields in his eight arms a conch, um, many-spoked discus, shield, sword, mace, arrow, bow, and noose, and who is possessed of the ashtasiddhis. In the form of the divine fish, may he protect me in water from the species of aquatic creatures, representing the noose of Varuna. May he who appeared of his own will in the form of a religious student, dwarfish in stature, guard me on land. And may the same Lord, appearing in his cosmic form as Trivikrama, guard me in the air. May the almighty Lord Narasimha, the slayer of Hiranyakashipu, protect me in places full of danger, such as a forest and the forefront of a battle. Lord Narasimha, whose tremendous peals of laughter when he raised them, the quarters violently echoed and embryos were discharged. In other words, that um, Asura women would miscarry in fear hearing the laughter of Narasimha. May the celebrated divine boar, in whose person the yagna stand represented, and who lifted up the earth on his tusks, protect me on the road. May Rama guard me on, the, on, um, on mountain peaks. This is Rama as in Parasharama. And may Sri Rama, the elder brother of Bharata, accompanied by Lakshmana, protect us when we are away from home. May the divine sage Narayana keep me aloof from violent religious practices, such as the employment of magic spells for malevolent purposes, and all sins of omission. In other words, from whatever I forget to do in the practice of spirituality. And the sage Nara protect me from pride. May Datta, the master of yoga, guard me against abandoning the practice of yoga. And may Lord Kapila, the Lord of Prakriti, save me from the bondage of actions. May Sanat Kumara guard me against the shafts of love meaning the, sha the shafts of kama, the shafts of like lust and desire. Lord Hayagriva, from neglecting the, uh, uh, the devas met with on the way. Narada, the foremost of celestial sages, against drawbacks in the worship of the deity in the shape of the 32 transgressions listed in the works on devotion. Uh, there's a whole list of those. Um, such as to worship with your uh, go into a temple with your shoes still on, so on. And may Sri Hari manifested as the divine turtle keep me away from every description of hell. May Lord Dhanvantari guard me against an unwholesome diet. And Lord Rishabhadeva, whose mind is perfectly subdued, from the fear of the pairs of opposites. Again, may Lord Yagna save me from public scandal. Lord Balarama, from death at the hands of a human being, and Shesha from the class of serpents known as the Krodhavashas. May Lord Vipayana guard me against ignorance, and Lord Buddha against heretical creeds and neglect of duties. May Lord Kalki, who assumed that glorious manifestation for the preservation of righteousness, protect me from the Kali Yuga, the refuse of time. May Lord Keshava protect me with his mace in the morning, Sri Krishna, the protector of cows who holds a flute through the Sangava hours. Lord Narayana, who has his abode in water and who wields an upraised javelin in the forenoon. And the all-pervading Lord Vishnu, carrying the Sudarshana chakra in his hand, protect me at midday. 
May Lord Madhusudhana, who wields a terrible bow, protect me in the afternoon, and Lord Madhava, manifested in three glorious forms at dusk. May Lord Hrishikesha guard me in the first part of the night, and Lord Padmanabha alone during the second part until midnight, as well as at midnight. May the Lord bearing the mark of Sri Vatsa on his chest protect me in the latter part of the night. Lord Janardana carrying a sword at the close of the night. Damodara um, bound my mother Yashoda protect me at dawn. And Lord Vishveshvara manifested as the time spirit during both the morning and evening twilights. Revolving all around, hurled by the Lord in the form of a discus with a rim fierce as the fire raging at the time of universal dissolution. Completely burn, completely burn my enemy's host at once as fire helped by the wind consumes hay. Um, and then addressing the Lord's mace, Paul Moldeke. Beloved as you are of the invincible Lord and sending forth sparks whose impact is as deadly as that of a thunderbolt, O mace, thoroughly crush, completely pound the Kushmandas, Vainayakas, Yakshas, Rakshasas, Bhutas, and Grahas, and pulverize, crumble to dust my adversaries. And then addressing the Panchajanya conch. Blown by Sri Krishna and shaking the hearts of foes with your terrific blast, O Lord of conches, may you drive away the Yatudhanas, Brahmatas, evil spirits, Matrakas, goblins, Brahmarakshasas, and other evil eyed spirits. Directed by the Lord, O sharp edged Nandaka, the foremost of all swords, may you cut down, O mow down my enemy's host. Cover the eyes of my wicked foes, O shield with a hundred moon like buttons and blind the eyes of the evil-eyed. From whatever evil spirits, comets, and even men, reptiles, and other biting animals, ghosts, or sins we have had fear, all these and whoever have stood in the way of our welfare may go to complete destruction through the utterance of the weapon of the divine name. May the glorious and mighty Garuda, who is extolled through hymns of the Sama Veda, such as the Brahad and Ratantara, may who is Veda personified, and Vishvaksena, one of the principal attendants of the Lord, protect me from all dangers with their very names. May the names and forms and weapons of Sri Hari and whoever carries him on his back protect us from all adversities and may the foremost of his attendants guard our intellect, indriyas, mind, and life. Even as really speaking, it is the Lord alone who constitutes whatever there is with form and without form. May all our troubles come to an end as a corollary to this truth. Even as the Lord, though undifferentiated in the eye of those who have realized their identity with him, himself acquires by his own maya potencies as well as forms and names, jewels and weapons. May the same omniscient and all-pervading Lord Sri Hari protect us from the strength of this very fact by, his, by all his manifestations at every place and time. May Lord Narasingha defend us in the quarters as well as in the intervening corners, above and below and all round, inside as well as outside, dispelling the fear of his people by his roar and having eclipsed all luminaries by his own effulgence. O Indra, this prayer, imbued with the spirit of Lord Narayana, has been taught to you. Protected by this, you will easily and completely conquer the generals of the Asura troops. Anyone whom, this man wearing, anyone whom the man wearing this armor may behold with his eyes or duly touch with his feet is immediately and completely rid of fear. No fear from a ruler, robbers, evil spirits, and so on, nor from a tiger and other ferocious animals, nor from any other quarter can ever seize the man who has his mind fixed on this sacred mantra. Of your a certain Brahmana, who was a scion of the sage Kushika and had his mind fixed on this sacred text, cast off his body in a desert through concentration of mind accompanied by retention of breath. Surrounded by ladies, Chitrarata, the chief of the Gandharvas, once flew in his aerial vimana over the spot where the Brahmana had died, and instantly fell down with his vimana head downwards. Picking up the bones of that deceased, of that deceased sage, according to the advice of the Valakilyas, he dropped them into the river Sarasvati, which flew in an easterly direction close by, bathed, and then returned to his own abode amazed. Sri Shuka continued. All beings bow to him who listens to this prayer at an opportune moment when he is threatened with some danger and who fixes his mind on it. 
nay, he is rid of all fear. Having learnt this prayer from Vishvarupa, Indra, who performed a hundred yagnas in his previous life, completely and decidedly conquered the Asuras in battle and enjoined the sovereignty of the three worlds. Thus ends the eighth discourse entitled The Text of the Narayana Kavacha Taught in Book Six of the Great and Glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita. So I think we should probably stop there for time. Um, the story does continue of um, Indra and the aftermath of this war, but we can resume that we can resume it next week. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. That's nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Namaste, Mary. It's always nice to have you. <laughs> It's interesting how the gods love Indra and how they protect Indra. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. they give, that they give him the Narayana collection. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, and, and it's interesting too that he got it, well, from his, his substitute guru, um, um, but who himself learned it from Shukracharya, the Asura's guru. I know. Yeah, was the lineage of the Narayana Kavacha. It was, it was the Asuras knew it first. Wow. But um, they didn't make proper use of it. Yeah. So it's a, like a message that if you don't use natural law for the good, then it's also, you know, you lose it. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know? Exactly. Great. Thank you. Any questions, anybody? Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, there's like, you know, uh, there's mention of the Vinayakas, a class of evil minded demigods. Yes, um, this is unrelated to Vinayaka as a as a name of Ganesha. Right. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, yes, it, um, Vinayaka is also a name of Ganesha, but the Vinayakas are a, a separate thing, a certain type of dark spirit in the um, Atarva Veda, there is a list of dozens and dozens of different kinds of dark spirits, um, such as Vinayakas and many, many others. Um, it's fairly obscure to hear the term used in that sense, but that's what it was referring to. Right. Well, interesting. All right. Yeah. Um, Yes, that's true, Radha. Um, later, uh, later on in the Bhagavatam, and s several times throughout the Bhagavatam, we get some lists of types of dark spirits as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Thank you guys very much for coming. Um, happy uh, Krishna Janmashtami tomorrow. Tomorrow. Uh, that's, tomorrow. That's what? yeah. That's the big one of the whole year for me. Yeah. Yeah. What's the what's the what are some good ways to observe it? Fasting. Uh, you yeah. can think tomorrow, yeah, yeah. Andy. Hmm? You can join us on the Zoom satsang tomorrow. Oh, sweet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'll share it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going, uh, my plan is to go to the temple in town. They're doing a thing tomorrow, but I don't know how strictly you're quarantining if you just flew back from Africa, but. Um, yeah. Well, you know, we, get, we do get tested at the airport, so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So should be good. Yeah. I, I um, got tested as well, so I think I should be good to go, but um yeah, yeah so oh. i i believe we're still on i know that um that uh pandit sarati was out of town recently but my plan was to go to the temple as as long as he's back which i think he is um because i oh. always i love celebrating uh janmash to me with a community of devotees in person that's always my favorite way but what yeah, time? I, know, I, I know you love fasting and, and yeah you can fast people sometimes fast until um fast till midnight sometimes because Lord Krishna was born at the stroke of midnight wow. um, tomorrow night. Okay. So some people kind of will keep a vigil until midnight and fast until midnight and only have a little bit of prasad then. Um, wow. But you, you don't have to stay up that late if you don't want to. But some, some devotees do that just to honor the fact that he was born at, at midnight. Okay. And I assume it's 
it's uh, observed than kind of like an ekadashi where you're just chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Rama a lot. Or, yeah, you know, doing Krishna, Krishna pujas, any kind of Krishna mantras. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Any other like particular suggestions on uh, observing and celebrating it? I mean, there's different ways people do, like a lot of people love to cook food and offer it to Krishna, like um, Kheer or Ras Malai, or they have, um, in South India, they have their own, they'll mainly like um, dairy sweet, sweet milk and butter and cream and all the things that Krishna loves. And um, some people will like rock, um, rock a cradle with the Bala Krishna, the baby Krishna, um, oh like caring for him as if he was their child. How, however your devotion connects with him best. Amazing. Yeah, everyone and, has their own way. And it's his uh, uh, birth, uh, celebration of birth? Yes, his, his, it's his birthday tomorrow night at midnight. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Cool. Janmashtami literally means um, birth on the 8th because it's the 8th day of the lunar month. Awesome. Yeah, so, yeah. Happy Janmashtami. Beautiful. Happy Janmashtami. All right. See you um, next week, if not sooner. All right. Thanks so much, Devala. Hari Om. Hari Om.